Hi. Okay, so we're live. All right. Perfect. Um, thanks for joining us today, everyone. I'm Jen Shonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. I'm here today with the incredibly thoughtful speech language pathologist, Marge Blanc, and she's going to be helping us to better understand echolalia and natural language development. Marge has spent 25 years working with children and young adults during these changing times. She founded the Communication Development Center in order to provide specialized services to children and young adults who benefit from sensory motor supports. After meeting her first autistic clients as a clinical associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Marge began systematically ap applying the research results of Barry Prezant. Amy Weatherby and colleagues who discovered that the steps of gestalt language development apply to all gestalt, I say this wrong every time, but gestalt <laughs> language processors. Analyzing language samples over the years, Marge published Natural Language Acquisition on the Autism Spectrum, the Journey from Echolalia to Self-Generated Language, which I have here and we will be um, discussing a little bit about. Uh, which is a book that describes similarities and differences in children's language development journeys. Marge has authored e-courses, articles, seminars, and workshops on her aspects of motor speech and language development in autism. All her articles are available at her clinic's website, which is www.communicationdevelopmentcenter.com, and we'll be sure to post uh, those links as well in the chat and on our website. Welcome, Marge. Thank you so much, Jen. It's absolutely delightful to be here. Thank you. Same. Um, so before I hand it over to you, uh, a couple brief housekeeping notes for everyone. We're live on YouTube right now. Um, the recording will be available to watch at any time after this airs, and we will get both Spanish and English captions as well as a transcript. Um, we would love for people to ask questions. I think we already have a few, which is amazing. Um, feel free to ask them as you have them. We're going to try to get to them at a couple of different points during this presentation. Um, and you just have to be logged into your YouTube account if you do want to ask a question or comment. Um, and as always, we would love to hear more about you. Um, if you're comfortable, please feel free to let us know a little about yourself. Um, so with that, I would love to hand it over to Marge and we will get going. Well, wonderful, Jen. Thank you so much. And thank you all for this incredible forum. It's been just a delight um, to see the variety of presentations you've had. People I would never think I would get to hear, both live and the recordings. It's just, it's just marvelous. It feels like a coming of age in so many ways that, um, you know, it's interesting to me that during this pandemic, we've become as creative, I think, as we have. I mean, obviously there have been, you know, all kinds of things to deal with that haven't been easy. But one thing I think, think we've done, I mean, I don't know about humanity in general, but I think that there are certainly a lot of you who have done really creative things. And this is, this is right at the top of that list, I think. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I, uh, I want to say too, before you start, Marge, um, so I mentioned your book before. This is it. It's called Natural Language Acquisition on the Autism Spectrum. Um, this book is available, I think, for $29.95. And <laughs> as you can see, I have taken quite a bit of notes. Um, it is extremely eye-opening and informative. And even for me, I have learned so much that I really wasn't aware of. And this is, this has been such a gift and um, we'll go through it more later, but I just, I want to really tell everyone how great this is because. And the thing is, is um, you, you don't have to pay a lot extra to get one with all of Jen's post-it notes in it. So <laughs> then you can, you can really do the, you know, the cliff note version besides. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this presentation today, I'm very excited about because 
Um, there's going to be an ASHA uh, webinar that is the American Speech Language Hearing Association webinar coming up in the next couple of weeks. And it will include a lot of the step-by-step -step process that SLPs, speech language pathologists, are going to be looking for as they apply this particular protocol. So what we get the opportunity to do today is to go a bit beyond the protocol. We will do the protocol, no question, but we will get to go beyond it. So when I first was imagining how this would go, I thought that we would just focus on what this particular slide says, and that is echolalia is all about language development. And we will indeed do that, but the, we will also get to a part two of this um, uh, PowerPoint, which is going to be going beyond that and talking about the value of echolalia, the value of, as Jen says, and you know, the way you pronounce gestalt, half the people do. I just want to tell you. <laughs> So, um, but we're going to talk about the value that lurks because it's not always obvious, lurks within the gestalts that children, older teens, uh, young adults, all of us have as we use our gestalts. And, you know, Jen and I were talking about this the other day that when you're an adult and you can call it the way you see it, you call it a quote. Mm -hmm. But if you're a young child and you're quoting, you know, Buzz Lightyear, um, nobody gives you credit for quoting someone who you admire. So language development, but then part two, um, two individuals who I've known for some period of time are now adults. Um, my friend uh, on, can you see my cursor? No, you can't see my cursor. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I won't. I gesture wildly. So I was trying to use my cursor to gesture, but I won't do that. So on your left is my friend, Benjamin, who's standing behind uh, a window. Is that your left? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> so I have known Benjamin since he was 10 years, almost 10 years old, and he's now 26 and he's now in college. Um, my friend on the right is Derek. I've only known him for about three years, um, but he is turning 21 this Saturday. So he is also going to college. So we want to talk about the, um, the things that are beyond language development. Okay, Jen said, let's define things early on. And I was going to, in my style of talking about the context, define it later, but I think she's absolutely right. So let's talk about Gestalt language development and analytic language development. So these terms, I will just tell you, existed in the dark ages of our, my profession, and they're here to stay. So we, we, we can talk about them in ways that are a little bit more um, user-friendly, but these are the terms that are there. So analytic language development is what people have thought of as typical. You know, little kids have their first words, they start putting first words together, they build little phrases, they build sentences, and everybody says that's the way language development is. But almost 40 years ago now, researchers realized that that was not the en entirety of language development. And so those early researchers who we will talk about as we go on here, but those early researchers realized that it's only one style of absolutely typical, absolutely normal language development, the other one being Gestalt. So the difference is that down at the bottom, you'll see a gestalt is a whole. It's a chunk of language. It can be any size. It can be a single word. If it's a chunk like, wow, it needs no further explanation. You don't really put wow in a sentence unless you want to say you want to wow someone or you want to say wow. 
wow is its own entity. And when it's a thing, it's a gestalt. <laughs> so it's a chunk of language at, of any size. And back in the 80s, um, Ann Peters put together the research of lots of other people and realized that there was something wrong with the one word unit of meaning that everyone was using as the foundation for normal language development. I mean, if you are an analytic processor, yeah, that's fine. If you're a little one who points to the ball and because mom pointed to the ball and you say ball because mom said ball, you are approaching that situation analytically. You're taking the sound stream around you and you're saying, when mom pairs it down to ball, that's really resonant with me. Now, this little guy over next to her is doing the whole thing. He's doing the whole ball game. He's describing the gestalt of what occurred with his um, viewing and the feeling he had when this ball went out of the park. And he's talking about it and he's saying it, but it's an intonation group. It's a group of language defined by the intonation, like the ball went out of the park. So that's a gestalt. So gestalt language development now, looking at the third paragraph there, um, is when your natural language acquisition or development, those are synonymous terms, start with a unit of meaning that Ann Peters defined. And she said, let's, let's get, get rid of this one word thing and call it one unit. So your language development, your natural language development begins with one unit of meaning and it's big. It's all about what happened at the ball game. So then in order to actually get to self-generated grammar or self-generated language, or being able to put together sentences word by word by word, which every individual does eventually, you've got to break down those gestalts. You've got to break them down in a couple of steps. And so a gestalt language processor is usually delayed. Some kids can go through that breaking down process really rapidly and kind of go under the radar, but it typically takes a little bit longer sometimes a long time, because if kids are not intelligible, if we don't understand them when they're saying those long gestalts, and basically we never do, then it's going to take them having to pare it down to a point that we can understand what they're saying. And so by the time that little boy says ball, we think, oh, he's saying ball, his first word. And we don't give him credit for the fact that he was talking about the ball a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And he's going to talk about the ball again, way more detailed in a way more detailed fashion than the girl is because he's seen the whole, he's seen the whole ball game. But gestalts. So gestalts come in all kinds of packages. And you know, you recognize that first one, a thousand years will give you such a crick in the neck and you can hear Robin Williams, you know, jump out of the lantern and talk about um, what it's like to be a genie to infinity and beyond is a popular one. And I use that as kind of the, the heading for this webinar because we're talking about the infinity of language development, but there's more and beyond. Fish are friends, not food. You know, you hear these kinds of gestalts and you think, what in the world? How does that fit? How does that fit? Coming to a theater near you, game over. I don't want to see it anymore. You can hear the voice that's been delivering those lines. Gestalts always come from somewhere else. And you can almost tell where they've come from. I've told you a thousand times. And when you can hear your own voice saying, I've told you a thousand times, and your child is saying, 
I've told you a thousand times, you think, whoa, that particular gestalt came from me. You need a timeout, quiet hands. You're not listening. You're such a baby. You know, you hate to hear your own voice when your child is saying these gestalts, but that's the essence of what happens. Um, they're not all, you know, a, a word of authority. They're, you know, lots and lots of gestalts. You know, a partridge in a pear tree, you know, the, the last line of the song, you know, it comes up again and again and again. Do you want some water? You know, that's one we hear all the time. Want some water? You hear kids say, some water? Water? And the reason they say water instead of water is because it's part of that initial gestalt. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit about the clinic um, where I work because I'm not there today. And I wanted you to see how it's set up to help kids who are Gestalt language processors, to help kids who are analytic processors. It doesn't matter the language style. It's just that oftentimes accessing your language is not easy. It's just not easy. You, as a child, you haven't had that language for very long. And people say, use your words. Well, I can't get there. If you've only had those words for like the last, you know, five minutes, you're not going to be able to get there without some access. So this clinic is set up so that there's a big trampoline that's not always used for jumping, but just a surface that as the OTs would tell us, if you can move a body out of a couch, you're going to be more regulated. You're going to be more alert. You're going to be able to do everything you can do better and more easily. The middle picture shows the ball that I added to my bag of tricks back at the university in 1993 um, when I met my first autistic clients and I learned about regulation. And interestingly, that was the time that, that Ann Donnellan was there and wrote her first book about the movement differences in autism. And I learned not from her directly, but she was very popular. People wanted to always go to her classes because she had such an interesting and useful take on autism at a time when she really was a pioneer. But the other pioneer who I met was a young OT student. She was a sophomore at the time. She was a line therapist in a ABA program, but she knew about regulation. And the first time she came to the clinic to watch uh, one of our clients who we shared, she said to me, he's gonna know where he is in space a lot better if you put your hands in front of his belly as he's pinballing around the room like Ann Donnellan described. And I thought, genius, absolute genius. You know, coming from the mouth of babes, as they say, you know, a, a sophomore in kinesiology who taught me about self-regulation. So that ball was purchased back in that time. And it's been with me ever since. It's never had to, it never needed any more air, nothing. So you can see now over on the trampoline, um, just how you can use a, you can, you can just hang out on a trampoline. And if everybody gets too cozy, some interloper like me will come along and just move the trampoline surface a little bit. So everybody kind of wakes up and regulation begins again. Shall I pause right there, Jen? And you can tell me if we, how we're doing, are people feeling okay? Yes, uh, people have quite a few questions already. Um, I don't know if you want to get to any now or if we should wait. I should also say that Dr. Prezant is watching. Hello, you will see your dear picture soon. <laughs> also, for everyone, most people watching probably know who he is, but he is an amazing, another amazing speech therapist or speech pathologist who wrote Uniquely Human um, I was telling Marge earlier that I was listening to his podcast this morning 
And um, I, you know, read that book um, a couple of years ago, and it's extremely wonderful. And um, it's so valuable in helping to really see the gifts of you know, all people on the spectrum. And I'm very grateful for his work as well. Um, so uh, can I interject one thing before? Yeah. We so, so just to um, tell you, um, unfortunately, Justin's picture is not included. His picture is there, but not his painting. And the reason his painting is not there is because the uh, tiger was usurped by a lion. And I'll just leave it that little hanging thought. <laughs> That's great. Um, I actually, well, I'm going to wait to read the portions of your book until later, I think. Okay. Um, well, I don't, can... if you want to keep going for now, okay. everything, everything that you've said so far, um, it seems people are following and there's more specific questions. Okay, good. Well, so, let's do one thing that's kind of a specific here. Okay. because this shows kind of the textbook kiddo. Um, back when um, Barry Prezant was my mentor and he didn't know it, um, I met my first individual who was a Gestalt language processor. And um, I wrote about Dylan in all kinds of articles and talked about him forever because he was that textbook kid. He, he had... Um, minimal exposure to media at the time. So his gestalts, as he was about four years old, were things that he'd heard from his siblings and just from a little bit from movies, but not so much. They were more just from life. And so he was um, a boy who was able to go through the stages that I already knew about from Ann Peters and Barry Present. Um, he went through the stages just like clockwork. And so the first box you see um, on the left were some of his early gestalts. And um, you can see, first of all, that his gestalts were very everyday friendly language, mm -hmm. things you could say. And people would think you were um, putting together things with grammar. You know, it really could go under the radar. You know, I got it, here I come, I'm the king. You know, and I will say that nowadays with the media language that um, predominates the linguistic environment, if we could call it that, um, from media, we don't hear sentences like that anymore. And so kids don't have the opportunity to hear good, I'm going to call it I sentences. You know, we think we're doing a good job when we say, you know, tell me what you want. I want X. Well, is that really an I sentence? Is that really from your heart, from your gut, from your sense of who I am? You know, we're teaching kids inadvertently. No one's doing it, you know, on purpose, obviously, but we're teaching kids to be dependent on somebody else to create a full I. Mm -hmm. Wow. I know. You know, we don't do it on purpose. I mean, none of us would do it on purpose. Right. But back to Dylan, with the language environment he had, he got to mitigate very quickly, we got it. So he could take, I got it, he could change it, we got it. It didn't take him very many months to get to the place that he had those utterances in the second box there. And I showed just the cutout dinosaur because he would use that in lots and lots of ways. And that's the essence of stage two, which we'll get to and define it a little bit better. But I wouldn't, I'd really like you to just see what it's like when it works like clockwork. Okay, so cut out slinky, cut out dinosaur. And he's not telling us to do it. He's talking about how that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing, cutting out dinosaurs, cutting out slinkies. But he doesn't say it in this grammatical form like, cutting because that wasn't part of his gestalt. His gestalt was these simple verbs that you see in the first box. But then he started to mitigate even further. And he says to us, and I say us because it was me and two graduate students, all of whom were taking furious notes, not actually, we were, we were recording everything and then transcribing it later. But he says, then he turns to us, you cut out Slinky. 
So then you think, wow, he's really starting to use grammar. Well, you don't want to get fooled by how grammatical it seems because you realize, because, you know, Barry Prezant told us so, that it's just stage two and we've got to get down to stage three. We've got to mitigate down. We've got to get it down to single words. And Peter's told us the same thing. And I don't really know who the us is because this was 10 years after they told us. And I, I don't know who else was, was paying attention to uh, the Dylans of the day at that point. I don't know. Um, we had a few competing language influences, let us just say. Mm -hmm. um, okay, but he did it. He did it. Dylan got down to one word and he thought it was a little odd. I will say he thought it was odd. And when he said, I toy, it was like, I pared it down to the essence of what my gestalts were. You could see the quizzical yet light bulb look on his face. I mean, it was priceless and it was just, yeah. I mean, we all were singing and dancing and just so excited. But he had others that he pared down to single words, bubbles of bubbles. Um, but the thing that both Barry Prasant and Ann Peters said is don't go past stage three without spending plenty of time there. Mm -hmm. Because you can you can slip back into stage two. You can go back to, um, you know, you got bubbles. Here come bubbles. I'm gonna get bubbles. You know, you could you could go back to that, but you'd be going back to your gestalts. And that's I think if I were to say what is the heart of the matter, I would say that is where the heart of it is. And when I read. Um, Dr. Prezant's article in, in 1983, he had a, two lines on a grid crossing at stage three. And it is exactly that. It's where the gestalt breaks down, breaks down, breaks down. The analytical starts to emerge. And it is exactly at that moment. Anyway, not to spend the rest of our hour and a half on that. All right, so stage four looks like grammar because it is. And the nice thing about that grammar is that it's not great grammar. It's not perfect grammar. Mm -hmm. It's self-constructed grammar. And of course, there are more stages beyond the four that both Barry Passant and, and Ann Peters talked about because, you know, other researchers were looking at grammatical development and there's, there, there are fancy levels of grammar that we will talk about later. But the essence of it is in that right there. I got magic. Go get a magic. So you can see right then and there, you know, magic is not a gestalt. It's a word. Right. Yeah. So this was more of a straightforward example here. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that straightforward example has been in the back of my mind always as I see other kids, um, young adults, even, whose straightforwardness trajectory, that trajectory of looking straightforward isn't that clear. You don't see clarity like this a lot. Yeah. You, see, you see kids who are young enough to go through the process rather quickly. And those are the kids who I mentioned are going to be presented in the ASHA webinar. There are going to be three case examples. And that's what allows us today to not spend too much time there. Um, this is more pictures of the clinic you can look at. If you think there's a, a question or a composite question, Jen, that ought to be asked now, we can do that. Okay, let me see here. Um, I actually, let me see if I might use one here. Um, Okay, so this is just, this is first of many <laughs> points that I highlighted here, um, but I would like to just read it here. Um, so 
you write, those of us who believe that our kids with autism can achieve much more have felt outnumbered as the term functional speech has proliferated in the autism community, indirectly suggesting that our kids lack the capacity for normal language development, a set of learned survival phrases are selected as practical targets. Sadly, in the name of function, our kids are shortchanged with little regard for their intellectual or, lingu or linguistic potential. Um, and then you do go on to mention Dr. Prezant and um, you know, he, he is quoted as saying from using, as children develop joint attention, language develops from using primarily chunks of language to using more frequent mitigated echolalia and making novel combinations. Um, do you want to just comment on sure. functional language? Sure, and I think Jen, one of the one of the um, saddest um, uh, misunderstandings there have been in child development is that that critical learning period stops at age six, seven, eight, whatever you think, whatever you read, you know, but beyond the age of eight or so, the notion that left brain grammar is, is done, that development of left brain grammar is done, is based on um, the individuals who get there within that time period. I mean, yeah. I, I hate to say it, but what, what, was, what was found to be the, um, the statistical truth doesn't apply to the outliers. Mm -hmm. And that's it's something that, you know, and actually Barry Prezant and I have talked about that. I've talked about that with numerous people who spend time with older individuals and not just teenagers. I mean, I remember the day I realized that 12, 13, 14 year olds could learn rule-based grammar. And, you know, I have, I'll credit one person with saying that out loud. Um, I have to think, she was another person at UW-Madison, um, Robin Chapman. Robin Chapman was the first person I heard say out loud that that was truth. And then as time has gone on and we've given child development, human development, a greater chance, mm -hmm. um, we realized that late teenagers, early 20s. And, and I don't know if it stops there. It's just that Benjamin, who's um, on your top left, um, he's now 26. So that's the oldest person I can comment <laughs> on. But I know for a fact that Benjamin is still working on rule-based grammar. And it's because it matters. I mean, it's not just a rule for a rule's sake, like, you know, let's make the subject and the object agree, blah, 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 the kind of thing we think of as grammar, but it's kind of the embedded clause that says if. And his, his, his embedded clause is, if you will help me, I will achieve. Mm -hmm. So it matters. And so it's grammar that matters. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, and that wasn't, um, I'm not trying to completely dodge your question, um, Jen, but that <laughs> kind of focuses on one, one, I think, misunderstanding that we have. So this particular slide is all blurred because everybody's moving. And um, the, the point here is that as individuals get older and bigger, there needs to be more oomph in their regulatory activity. And so what little kids, you can put them in the Lycra and you can swing them back and forth and you can flop them on the couch. And as individuals get older to achieve that same level of self-regulation so they can still do as the OTs say, um, the, um, the just right challenge, keep learning in other words, they need more. And so you can see a rather larger individuals <laughs> creating some of the movement on this uh, trampoline so that the smaller individuals can have greater excursion. And as if what that translates into for OT talk is proprioception, so deep probe. And as the OTs say, probe is your friend. 
Yeah. It can calm you, it can alert you. Okay, and this I am show, I wanted to show this series of slides, and then we'll go on and talk about the more contentive part of this um, webinar. But I wanted to show you the same individual under three conditions. So in the first condition, he is flopped out, resting his weary little head on my knee and looking at the lineup of vehicles carrying various commodities to the other end of wherever. And we, we have such a stereotype. We say, well, he's lining things up. Well, he's looking at wheels moving. Well, he's doing these visual things. But you know what? The visual masks what an individual needs with their body. And so until you have an opportunity to sit up and be supported in a way that is of your body, for your body, by your body, you know, you, you rely on somebody else's knee. Mm -hmm. And so this same individual was able to play just as well on the loft, which you can't exactly see, but it's, it's to the bottom right corner of your screen. But he is being supported by this lycra, which gives him the, the feedback so that he can stay alert. Now, the final slide, I even asked Jen if she thought I should show this slide because it looks like a bunch <laughs> of SLPs are throwing this kid in the air and surely that's not safe. Well, it's not, but I mean, it wouldn't be safe were we not uh, doing this with family and have done this for 25 years and know how many people it takes to hold a, a piece of lycra in place. You know, OTs can do this with one person. They know how to tie knots and hang stuff. And SLPs, it takes a ton of SLPs to do that. But in this particular case, the family was visiting and um, we have grandpa in the foreground and grandma, you know, holding a camera somewhere uh, just above. And then we have um, undergrad students and we have um, mom is somewhere in the picture. And so it's really a family event that is shared with this individual very alerted. Yeah. And I want to say too, that one of the things that I loved about your particular practice and, you know, everything that you write about is that you really do include um, the expertise from OTs and about sensory regulation. And so, you know, it's a multidisciplinary approach that is really respectful of the child's needs you know, you allow for that movement and you're, you're really being supportive through play. And that is right. just perfect. And that's a really good point, Jen, is that I think that sometimes we think that play means you've got some toys. Yeah. And, you know, and yes, there were some toys there, but that doesn't make it play. And unless, unless the body is playing as well as the mind, the mind doesn't play as well. <laughs> So, okay, so first, uh, our, uh, yeah, I say first, but that's clearly not first. Um, but first, before we go on with Gestalt language development, let's look at analytic um, just to have a frame of reference. And all of us know about analytic and language development, even if we've always thought it was just the typical. So you start with your single words on the left, You've got block, you've got big, you've got mine. And we know how it is when we have those first words. And then very quickly, that analytic processor puts those words together in little short um, combinations. And we don't necessarily think that they're phrases. Those of us who are SLPs think, oh yeah, I remember that, that stage of language development for little kiddos where you just add words together. And it's not about grammar. It's just about putting two words together. There's um, an old uh, kind of adage in uh, speech language pathology about mommy sock. And if you could say sock mommy or mommy sock, it really doesn't matter which order because you can say, you know, dozens of things with those two words. So uh, the third slide or the third picture shows um, the blocks. Um, now being stacked a little higher and grammar is added and the grammar isn't good grammar, but that's what we want. We want experimental 
grammar where kids get to put things together in all kinds of ways and nobody's correcting their grammar. Mm -hmm. So going back to what you're saying, Jen, do we really need to teach this? Or is it so natural that if we try to teach it, we do the very things that I hate to say it, but Prasant and Peter said back in the day, and that is, you know, you mess it up. Yeah. Just mess it up. So stand back and let development happen. So by, by that fourth little one, uh, we see a grammar starting to emerge. Um, there are ways of looking at grammar, by the way. I don't want to ignore that completely. But there are ways of looking at grammar that respect what um, child development is all about. And we could talk about that maybe in the supplementary materials, but, there, but researchers back in the day you know, had got that all figured out and there are wonderful resources, developmental sentence types, developmental sentence scoring. Um, we could put that in the, the um, supplemental materials. Do we have any questions that relate to any of this stuff first? Let me see here. Um... So I think a lot, some of these you're going to get to after. Okay. Um, maybe there is one that you could answer now from 111 Tamron, which says, could you talk about echolalia as being used as a stim? Does it naturally reduce as the analytical type of language development increases? Wow, that is a great question. And you're right, yeah. we will talk about that later. But you know, there's going, one of our... Um, uh, videos will show that I think very clearly because we all do things like I don't know what you're doing to stay alerted right now Jen but I have my the the soles of my feet are firmly planted on the rungs of my the stool I'm sitting on and I am pushing very hard I have my legs crossed together very hard <laughs> <laughs> and I can't say that I'm not using my own intonation and speech and stress to keep myself alerted as well. So I would say that um, yes and yes. And yes, let's talk about that later and we will talk about the differences and yes, let's okay. do that. There may be one other, or actually okay. two other that are related that you might wanna to get to now. Okay, okay, so from Kelly Knight, SLP, what tools are there to help identify the function of echolalia or scripts? going into a meeting with a BCBA that wants to extinguish echolalia with stimulus matching or something, uh, have in the student listen to, having the student listen to music. They say they have evaluated and all instances of echolalia do not have communicative intent and only service the student's need for auditory input or stimulation. Wow, so it sounds like an article that, that, that Kelly, you wrote. That's good. <laughs> so I would say, first of all, um, let's ask Kelly and any other um, folks who would like to join up with other like-minded souls um, to uh, come to the Natural Language Acquisition Facebook um, study group and talk about that because that is the kind of thing we talk about all the time. Um, finding intention, as Dr. Prezant said a long time ago, is not going to be just a quick fix. You can't do it quickly. You need to know the individual really, really well to know the intentions. And you have to start, I dare say, with an, an incredibly open mind. And so before you go to that IEP meeting, there's about 50 steps to go through. So we ought to talk about that in great detail on in that study group. I, I don't want to disappoint you, Kelly, but Let's do that. And we can post the link to that. Um, okay. Maybe one of my teammates could post the link to that group. That sounds um, really good. And, and I, I would maybe just add to that, that, um, you know, I think this is one of the barriers that we run into because, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of chefs in the kitchen, in, you know, for, for our kids and, um, you know, not everyone has the same training. Right. And, you know, we need to make sure that people who are, um, you know, making goals for language are the people who are actually trained in language development. Right. And so I, you know, I would kind of make that point as well that, 
you know, every child who is um, getting some sort of speech and language intervention should have, uh, you know, a, a professional who's trained in those areas, mm -hmm. you know, as the person right. helping to make those decisions. For right. That and I think, Jen, it's going to get easier and easier because when we have um, webinars like this one, and when we have the webinar through ASHA, I think that the community of those of us who really believe in child development is growing, I think, exponentially. I just feel yeah. that around me. And really, truly, all you need to do is believe in children. Yes. And Absolutely. believe that, that autism doesn't make you anything different from a child. You are a child. And, and as was proven almost 40 years ago, um, individuals, autistic individuals develop language, have the capacity to develop language. It's not a new phenomenon. We've known this for a long time and we've kind of lost our way, I think. Um, those of us who really believe in child development, we've lost our way a little bit. Um, and I think that we are finding it again. I honestly do. Yeah. And I'm gonna just, just kind of move on here because okay. I realize we've actually, um, yes, it's been 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> so let's look at Gestalt um, language processors. So, and I think, you know, and nobody means ill, obviously. No one means ill, obviously, Jen. And I think this slide helps explain it a little bit. You know, we don't see Gestalt language processors among neurotypical children who have good access to a good language environment very often. We actually don't see it. Mm -hmm. Now we did back in the day because the language environment was um, such that we knew where language came from. And people were studying that. I mean, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, um, speech language pathologists and linguists were looking at language development to try to figure out how kids did it. And the thing that is so striking is when you look at the kids who are reported in Ann Peters 1983 book, they were going through mitigation in a couple of weeks. So there would be a gestalt and you'd know where it came from. And you'd listen to this kid in the back seat of your car talking to his sibling. And that those two kids would be talking it over. They'd be using that little gestalt. And the child who had the gestalt would be figuring it out. He'd be mitigating it right there on the spot and realizing that it wasn't quite right. Mm -hmm. And so his, his friend in the back seat of the car would help him learn that. And so kids made those changes very rapidly, but somebody was listening and they knew who, where the language came from. Nowadays, we don't recognize that so much because we have kind of a stereotype that if you can't understand it, it doesn't exist. And if you can't understand it, it must be babbling. And if you can't understand it, it's just jargon. And if it's unintelligible, you get cut out of some of the research that looks at kids who are, um, you know, autistic kids, yeah. you know, get cut out of the research because they're unintelligible. And so the natural processes that were so well understood are less understood in some ways today because of those factors. The lack of intelligibility is because the gestalts are different. Wow. If you're taking your gestalts from media, they're long, they're complicated, they have intonation that sounds like goofy or buzz. They don't sound like your big brother. Right. So, and Marge, uh, just to point out that this is, this is like another great example of um, looking at things like from your own perspective versus the other person's perspective, right? It's, you know, we're kind Absolutely. of assumptions based on what we think. Absolutely. It doesn't necessarily 
you know, mean that it's Which, actually you know, happening. <laughs> and that, that hounds us all the time because, you know, we think that adults are so smart. And, you know, that was really the premise that Ann Peters was going on back in the 80s was, you know what, language development doesn't, doesn't happen the way adults think it should. Like, you know, one, one person who I've been communicating with recently is saying in her school, everybody starts with, you know, a, like a sentence strip. You start with the first word and the second word and the third word as if there's logic to that. And there might be adult linguistic logic to that, but it's not child logic. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. All right, so I've already talked about Ann Peters um, to a great extent, but you will have access to these slides and you can go back and read some of the gems that um, she was able to present to us in 1983. Do you mind if I do this, Jen? Just keep going. Yep, go ahead. I think we might have to. Um, and then the very same year that Barry Brazant told me personally, not really, it was 10 years later um, before I heard about it. And it was from, you know, a couple of other sources along the way, but told me to look for four stages. And so I did, and I found them. So this is, this is how it was written in the article 1983, pared down to just the, the bare bones, um, but there were four stages. Should I just keep going? Okay. So then in um, 2012, when I finally published my book, um, it, it, Dr. Brazant was good enough to write a, um, an endorsement of that, which I include here, not to say, ah, my mentor um, saw me through, but to say, you know, even those researchers in the 80s found this link from that time to this time to be solid. And even though there weren't necessarily, you know, a lot of studies along the way, we didn't really need them. The evidence was there. And so I include this comment from Barry Prezant to just say, this is, this, is, this is a link. This is a real link. Kids haven't changed. Yes, language sources have changed. Yes, access to language sources have changed. But kids haven't changed. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a little bit of a summary. Um, so NLA, natural language acquisition, as I always say, it's nothing new. It's absolutely nothing new. Um, everything I learned, I learned either from those two mentors I mentioned or from Benjamin or Dylan or the other kids around me. And so I did, I did streamline things and I did quantify things because, you know, as I was charged with um, finding the longitudinal um, picture um, as to how kids do this, you know, I did realize that um, this stage three needed to be really emphasized in our minds so that we didn't do the things that um, Prasant and, and um, Peters said would happen if we didn't pay attention to single words. Um, now, this, this will be covered a lot in the ASHA webinar, so we're not going to really focus on that. So I, I apologize to those of you in the audience who would like a bit more information. We will have a few slides that talk about the stages a little bit in a moment. Um, I think we've already talked about this. That is, why is it that we're so biased? Mm. Why are we so biased? towards analytic language acquisition? Well, first of all, we understand kids who are analytic processors. We understand their first words. And part of the reason we understand them is because we just said them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think of the irony of, you know, as the, the person who's asking the child, say ball, and the child says, Muh. and you say, oh, yay, yay, you said ball. Well, was that any more clear than if the child had spontaneously said, wah, 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 wah? no, but we said it first and we pointed to it. And this child is trying their hardest to do what we asked them to do. 
So intelligibility is a big factor. Um, and like we just have talked about, it's easy for us to understand. It's so logical in adult logic and it matches our grammar. And we love that. We think that our grammar is somehow magical and wonderful. Which, <laughs> if you look at other cultures and other languages, our grammar isn't anything special. It's just ours. Okay, um, reasons that Gestalt language processing is under-recognized um, in all kids. Um, first, in the little neurotypical kiddos, it sounds like babbling. And their first units, as Ann Peters called them, um, just go undetected. So this little guy talking about the wonderfulness of his story, nobody understands him, nobody really cares. They say little boys, you know, are late to develop language anyway. And so nobody worries about him until the females in the household say, well, this is an actual story. This is, this is the grand Paul story. And this is my great nephew, Andy, um, who um, the guys in the household didn't care. They thought he was doing just fine because they kind of could share this gestalt with him. The females said, I think Andy needs to go to speech therapy. Um, so that's the younger kids. Older kids, as you were pointing out earlier, Jen, they're, they're just unintelligible when they're young um, for whatever reason. Their gestalts are too long. Their, their sensory motor development is inadequate. Sensory motor development, of course, is speech development as well. You know, our body doesn't stop somewhere along in here, you know, and, you know, this is actually part of our body. And so as we support ourselves from deep breathing and intonation and we get to our mouths, you know, those of us who grew up in the days of um, communicative sciences and disorders, thinking that apraxia was all about the mouth, realize that dyspraxia or lack of praxis or lack of motor planning goes deep, deep, deep. And obviously it took PTs and OTs to teach us that, but I think we, we do realize that, you know, the larynx is part of the body. And, you know, the diaphragm is indeed part of the body. And so <laughs> deep breathing is actually pretty critical to get to the mouth. So anyway, um, without good sensory motor development, um, our older uh, gestalt processors are not um, understood. And they, by the time they are understood, they're going to be 10 years old, perhaps, or 12 years old. And until they can get somebody to listen to them because they had to pare everything down. They had to get to a place where we could recognize that, oh, language, oh, yeah, dragon, dragon. He said his first word, not so. All right, so the stages of natural language acquisition, which I did coin the term um, to, you know, validate the naturalness of it all. Um, and to comment on how it is language acquisition, it is normal, natural language acquisition, doesn't need to be differentiated from analytic language acquisition, except that the units that an individual begins with at stage one are gestalts. They're whole chunks. They could be short chunks. They could be, oops, they could be, don't, they could be, no, you know, those are nice gestalts to have, <laughs> or they could be really, really long. And this is a, a, a quote from um, uh, Jimmy Cricket about the conscience. And what my buddy Benjamin was trying to get to um, as he would try to pare it down and get to the word conscience was just that. It was like, so you talk about communicative intentions. What were his intentions when he would start out and say, um, you know, I can't even say it, you know, the long Jiminy Cricket line. What he's trying to say to me is, how do I know if I'm following my conscience? 
let your conscience be your guide. And that's what he wanted to talk about. He's a very morally astute, deep, spiritual thinker. And he wanted to know why did that cartoon have Goofy on one side as you know, the devil and on the other side with a halo over his head. What is conscience? How do you get to conscience? And so you think about what are communicative intentions and they're deep. I think that's one mistake that we just collectively as adults have made. Stage two, divide up that long, let's get out of here, let once more into two parts, get, let's get out of there. And, and I think Ann Peters used the term freeing, freeing part of something that was a package, part of a bundle and freeing it so you could use it in different ways. Um, is that Joe, does he want us? Uh, I think he just has to mute his. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So then what happens when you freed up, let's get, you can, you can mix and match it with other things, with other chunks. And you can say, let's get some more conspiratorially with your sibling. Let's get some more. And you can conspiratorially say, want out of here. So this is still dividing things up, mitigating down, getting to single, not yet single bits, but starting to mix and match chunks and get to the point that you can go to the blocks, the building blocks that we think of the building blocks of language, getting down to single words, get more, one out. Or I think always, always of my buddy, Dylan, I toy. So the nice thing about stage three is it all happens relatively simultaneously, just like Dr. Prezant's graph. It's just like, it all comes together. It's like paring it down. It's like, it's simple, 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 simple. Oh, and now I get to expand and it all happens right there. As it expands, um, so stage four, first phrases, sentences, um, the, and I'll say one caveat about uh, first phrases and sentences. We're all so excited that this child is ready for grammar and we wanna just jump in with our sentence strip. Well, not, that's not a good plan. The reason being is it sounds just like stage two. When you get your sentence strip out, it's gonna sound like stage two and the possibility of going backwards is very real. So how you want to start with grammar is with unusual things that the child has not said with like, it's a dog. You don't want to start with it's. I'm ready. You don't want to start with I'm. Let's go. You don't want to start with let's. You want to start where you were in stage three, putting words together in little bits and then just adding a little bit of grammar so kids don't go backwards. And then that's why we need two more stages because obviously we need complex sentences and kids naturally develop those, but not really at the same time they're doing those first little phrases. So generating more complex sentences at stages five and six. Okay, a little one who is um, featured in the ASHA webinar um, these were some of her uh, stage one, two, three, four utterances, not fancy, not media, a little bit of media, Pinkie Pie, but Pinkie Pie was really more about a toy and a book, wasn't so much about videos. Um, but her gestalts were very helpful and sweet and pass under the radar very often because I can help you. Excuse me, there you go. You know, and those were all gestalts and her family recognized that. You know, don't was obviously the one word or the, you know, two morphemes, but you know, that's another one that doesn't sound that different from all other kid language. 
but her family knew the difference. Okay, and her mom is listening, by the way, and I told her we weren't going to go into her story in any great depth, and she's not going to take, that's her mom, by the way, under the Christmas tree, and um, she's not going to take any great credit for this. Um, I will just tell you the one thing about Zoe, and that is that by the time her mom recognized that she was a Gestalt processor at age 4-4, she had been at um, the she had an MLU of 1.9 words. In other words, her average length of her utterances was 1.9 words, which you think that that's not so bad, except she'd been there for a year. Mm -hmm. And that was her mom's clue, along with the fact that um, people at school had tried every single thing under the sun they could think of, and nothing changed until she applied um, NLA, Natural Language Acquisition, or Gestalt Language Development. Okay, stage two comments, Eeyore help you, Pinkie Pie help you, Mommy Under Tree, they're Pinkie Pie. So more flexible, less accurate, if you will, than the built-in adult grammar at stage one, but much more flexible communicatively and on the road to language development, real language development. Okay, me, on, on, tree, tree. And this was her um, undergrad clinician um, who was uh, Jesse, who worked with her at the time. Um, I hope Jesse is here. Then um, at stage four, put on your head, put on my head. Eeyore want one. Jesse, help me. So you recognize the early grammar. Yeah. And it just sounds like kid grammar, just like analytic kids, but it's a little bit later because our Gestalt processors need to get down to the single word before they can do that. There's no shortcut. And Jen, I know a question you're gonna ask me and no, the answer is no, there is no shortcut. You can't just start with single words and expect that kids are gonna be able to jump to stage three. It doesn't happen. So what happens is, I'm sorry, what happens is kids will pick up those words, they will, but they're at stage one. So they're stage one gestalts. They try to break them down. They can't. They get stuck. Wow. I don't know if I should stop you here or not to ask some questions, but so I guess we're, we're going to be talking more about uh, when kids are in school a little bit. Um, but I'm sure a lot of people are wondering right now. So when your child is in school and they're a I'm going to say it wrong again, gestalt processor. Uh, what, what do they do? I mean, if most kids are, are taught as analytical processors, how do parents make sure that we're not like inadvertently stifling our kids' language development? That's great. Well, and the thing is, um, I think that, that parent wisdom, you know, rules here. And how do parents naturally talk to their kids before school started? They naturally talk in little gestalts. You know, you go through what you would say is, um, I'll go back to, let's go back to some gestalts we can just talk about for one second. Let's go back just to, okay. So those little gestalts, they're lovely little gestalts. Um, the ones that Zoe had, the ones that her parents said, and they were using their instincts and they were right. Yeah. And you know, the sad thing to me often is that really as an SLP, I mean, I might be a language expert in some way, but I'm not an expert on that child. Mm -hmm. And if a parent and an SLP work together, and I know you and your SLP do, you know, you can, you can do magic. But if you're not working together, you know, we're both, both sides of that, that coin are, are missing out because, you know, natural parenting says, talk to your kid, talk about what you're doing, yeah. use your, your, you know, in the vernacular joint action routines. And as you're making things together, as you're scooping out the ice cream, you're actually talking about the ice cream or you're talking about, you know, the other characters who scoop out ice cream and eat ice cream and 
you know, have fun. One parent said to me, she said, I learned, I learned that, that speech language pathologists don't always have fun. And that if you don't have fun, you might as well just do it yourself at home. <laughs> and that, that sounds terrible, but you know, I mean, those of us who were taught that you should be responsible, you know, you come out of grad school and you feel like, oh, I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. And you're supposed to have the answers and you're supposed to, you know, fix kids. But if there's no pathology in the first place, then you can, I mean, I, I can say that. I can say you don't have to fix anybody, but you don't know that when you're right out of school. You don't know that this, yeah. this is not a pathology, but that's one of the big things that if we ever get to, oh, we have just two more slides to go and we'll get to that point. Okay. <laughs> but when we get to the point about how this is not a pathology, um, then we can all relax. Yeah. And we can just treat kids naturally. Yeah. Okay, before we get to that, little aha moment that I promise you is coming in two more slides. <laughs> um, let's just take one, one scenario that is also very common. And that is, um, what if your child isn't speaking? And we're calling this echolalia. We're calling this, you know, that the child is echoing language from somewhere else. And if you're not speaking, you can't echo. Well, you can't echo out loud but you certainly do echo in your head. Mm -hmm. And isn't that where all of us do our language processing anyway? What we do with our mouths is just how we express it. And if we don't use our mouths, we use our hands and we sign. If we don't use our hands to sign, we keyboard, we type. If we don't type on a keyboard, we point, we letter point, we do other things, but they're all motor, outlets. All of those things take muscles and they are motor. And so if you will, if, I mean, this is, this is a little bit beyond this um, slide, but all of those things that we do with our bodies are how we behave. Those are our behaviors, so to speak. Language is not, it's in our heads. And so if you're not speaking, that doesn't mean you're not developing language. And so down at the bottom there, um, okay, what, what, let's not get to the bottom. Yeah, let's get to the bottom and then go backwards. <laughs> speech is not language. Speech is speech. Speech is talking. Speech is motor. Speech is an expression. It's a modality, just like typing or signing or accessing AAC. Mm -hmm. It's a modality to access language. Language is in our head. So lack of language, lack of speech doesn't mean lack of language. And if I were to say what I think the truth is, there's no such thing as nonverbal. We use a term like, like as, as Dr. Torres says, you know, we think of lack of speech as meaning lack of language. And like she said in the proposal to that research, how many years ago, six, seven years ago, you know, that is our deep and damaging um, supposition that is not at all true. And obviously with her research, she is getting us way beyond that point, which is wonderful. Um, but, but now down to the practical, because like you said, Jen, with a child you know very well, when you use analytic kind of ways of accessing analytic language, you know, kids will go along with this. I mean, they'll do it because we said it's important and yeah. because maybe we reward it with, you know, the ice cream or whatever, but it's not joyful. And when a, a child who is not speaking or not speaking intelligibly is faced with their first opportunity to hear language from their own device, that sounds like what they would choose, what resonates with them. You know, that joy comes out in their eyes. And so even if you can't test it exactly because there's not a behavioral way of testing it, 
that joy is something that no parent will miss. And so if you're partnering with your SLP, with your, your, your parent and your SLP partner, you've got it made. And then you can go from there. And then look at look at the next set at the next session and introduce something of that ilk again and keep going. Yeah. And we have a number of comments from people talking about how their students have used memes and viral videos and YouTube clips and Disney movies. And you know, it's beautiful to see that people are recognizing those things as communicative. Well, would you just tell those people, or I guess I could. <laughs> um, let's tell those people to definitely join that Facebook group because that is the topic that we've been talking about yes. most recently is how to bring our AAC up to a point that our Gestalt language processors really love them. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I wanted to mention Dr. Stigler. So, um, a lot of what these next couple slides convey is because of the um, article that she published in 2015, um, looking at the echolalia literature from all perspectives, from the um, behavioral psychology perspective, from the um, language development perspective, and she put it all together in one place. And this should definitely be on our, our list of things to access. Um, but it's because of what she did that we can go some of the next steps, which include this. So um, I, I decided not to put the words of the most recent book, uh, 2015. I don't know if you can see these. Um, and Dr. Prasant can correct my dating of the original uh, uh, publication, 1885. Um, but it was around about in there when the term echolalia was coined um, as a very pathological symptom of adult brain damage. So two kinds of aphasia um, have the quality um, that uh, they're both transcortical aphasias. Um, one is sensory, one is motor, um, and they both are considered having this um, pathological quality of echolalia being the mindless repetition of what is said. So the reason these books are highlighted under this um, lamppost, and you can see nothing else around them, is because of the experience that is um, uh, portrayed in the little adage about standing under the lamppost looking for your car keys that you've lost. So you stand under, under this lamppost and you look for your car keys and you look and you look and you can't find them. And an hour later, the passerby who noticed you um, comes by again and says, you didn't find your car keys yet? And I say, well, no, um, that's why I'm still looking. And he, the passerby says, well, why don't you go somewhere else? And, you know, if they're not under the, that lamp, why don't you go someplace else? And I say, but the lighting is better here. So in other words, if you're not looking for anything else besides pathology, that's what you'll find. And there are all those books. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, if you apply what Dr. Stigler found in her um, uh, literature review, if you turn on the light, that is go outside under the sun and look with the light of day at all these kids, and now we can say young adults um, around you and look at what they are doing with their quote echolalia, you can see that what it is is language development. So um, my dear husband uh, drew those two slides for me and I said, um, they are going to be famous. And he said, I don't even get them. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't matter. All right, so we're up to um, part two. And when uh, Dr. Krasant sent me a picture to use in um, the uh, uh, ASHA presentation we did in Chicago, 
um, he sent me one of himself and Justin. And that was a few years ago. So when I asked him if he would send me um, another picture or could I use that, that original picture, he said, well, sure, but let me send you a new one. So this is Justin and I did not include, like I say, Justin's beautiful artwork because I included Derek's. And um, I just felt that we could only have so many incredible pieces of art on this slide. So let's pause here and catch ourselves up and see where we're going. Okay. Um, so we do have a number more questions. Um, one is actually about your book, uh, that it's very hard to get a hold of it in the UK. Do you have any idea of how to buy it? <laughs> I was seriously thinking of an idea, and I know that who this person is. And she told me that the big problem is the tax. And I thought... I thought I have a sneaky way that I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. And it has to do with maybe finding someone to print it in the UK, honestly. Okay. But we but let's not <laughs> let's not go there yet. Okay. Um, and that was from Sam Evans. Now we have from Devesh Ramani. Uh, in this times, if there is an increased level of self-talking, sometimes it is loud or nonstop. How do we control and reduce it? Thanks. Good. Good, okay, I think it's absolutely time to talk about that now. Okay. So we've talked about language development and we've talked about how it, how it works for younger kids. Um, and now we wanna talk about older individuals and it's not as if for younger kids that, that phenomenon, let's ask that person how old um, his or her um, uh, client or, or child is, but anyway, I mean, okay. it certainly can happen with younger children too, but okay, so let's, if that, okay, let's just take the two conditions. And obviously there are more than two. There are probably as many conditions as there are individuals. But if an individual is saying the same gestalt over and over and over again, and no one has acknowledged it and addressed it, then we need to do that first. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like how um, uh, psychologists will explain paranoia, that if a patient says, I feel like I'm being followed, the first thing you better do is look behind them and see if they are being followed. Yeah. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so the first thing would be, I mean, and she, Martin, she said uh, 24, by the oh, way. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, so with younger children, we just want to find out what is that individual saying? Why is that individual saying that? Why has it not been adequately addressed? And one of the reasons that it probably has not been adequately addressed is because, and this is one of the adages about gestalts, is never, ever, ever can they be taken literally because they came from another source to begin with. So they're never exactly the way they sound. So for younger children, we wanna find out where they came from, why they're saying it, look deeply into intentionality like you were suggesting, Jen, and figure that out. So repeated gestalts in a young child are incredibly important. And one reason that maybe they haven't, and I realize I'm not addressing the question, I know that. <laughs> um, one reason that they haven't been fully addressed um, is because we treat them literally. So if a child says, um, is it time for lunch? Is it time for lunch? Is it time for lunch? And you say, no, I told you it's not time for lunch. No, it's not lunchtime until 1130. Is it time for lunch? Go beyond the literal. Us adults, we have that capacity, surely. And think about what that might mean. Is that child absolutely starving? Yeah. Now, let's go to the 24-year-old. All right, the, my buddy Benjamin would be in the category of someone who would use the repeating of intonationally rich, melodically excellent, because he's probably got perfect pitch, which so many individuals have perfect pitch, it drowns out the cacophony. And what I mean by that is I, am, I don't have a particularly gorgeous voice. 
And so I've always been kind of aware of my glottal fry. And I realized that a younger voice would sound a little bit more like in the register of a young child, which is one of the reasons that I really love undergrads. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, but if you have perfect pitch, the world is not only loud and obnoxious, but it all clashes, it clashes. And if you can take your song, your internal music and play it to yourself and drown out all of not only the voices that are like mine or, you know, the lawnmowers of the world or the, you know, lighting, the fluorescent lighting or the, you know, all the noises, the noise, you know, the hallway, you know, all the girls chattering. I'm sorry, I don't want to be anti-girl. All <laughs> of the individuals <laughs> chattering in the back of the room, you know, my buddy, my buddy Benjamin has to deal with all those chatty girls in his college. And he would like very much to be across the hall with his computer and his teacher's voice sent to him directly so he wouldn't have to drown out all of the other noise that is interfering with his learning. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that that's is I, I was just going to say that's a, a, a profound point because again, it goes back to the inner experience that the person is having. Um, and Dr. Prezant actually added that it sounds like it's, and this is what you're saying, sounds like this is as much of an issue of dysregulation and we must address that rather than focusing on just the speech. Right. And then, okay, there's a part two to this answer also, and I, we <laughs> clearly don't have time for it, but um the part two to this answer is that it also is a clue that there might be inputting at the auditory level that would be helpful. Mm. One of my OT colleagues in Madison, Sheila Frick, Vital Links, we should include something of hers, um, has been the mastermind behind listening therapies that actually are richly um, focused on what individuals are dealing with, as Dr. Prezant says, at the self-regulatory level. And so when my buddy Benjamin was um, growing up, and some of this didn't begin until he was an adolescent, and that's another point to this mm -hmm. is that as a younger child, he was really not um, so auditorily sensitive that sound bothered him tremendously. He could get along without noise canceling headphones. But by the time he became a young teenager, it was too much. Okay. And the words that he said to me at the time because he didn't want to make a big deal of it. He didn't want to go to the doctor and have somebody, you know, examine him. Um, and he didn't want somebody to, you know, take away his freedom to handle it in a respectful way. He wanted me to know it very quietly. And so he used the voice of um, Petrie in um, the well, time before time. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. And he said, very quietly, he was in the backseat of my car, and he said, me hurt everywhere. Oh. But you know how Petrie says it, you know, me hurt everywhere. And so if you said, I hurt, I'm, oh, I'm so miserable. If you said that, you'd get sent home, you'd get sent to the doctor, you'd get, uh, uh, who knows. But he knew that I knew that it was disguised Right. In a way, which is part of what part two of this webinar is about, is about the hidden gems in the gestalts that older individuals do not give up. So when he said, me heard everywhere, I knew this is serious. This is real, but I'm not to say it out loud. I'm not to play it back to him. I'm not to turn the car around and drive home. I'm not to do anything other than call Sheila Frick. Wow. And say, I think we need to start listening therapies. And just to say one thing about that, and I promise we'll move on, 
is that what's beautiful about their way of doing this auditory input is that it hits where auditory, visual, vestibular come together. And so in terms of, as Dr. Prasant says, whole body regulation, it mm -hmm. is a way to get at vestibular without having to spin and do the things that I think among, I don't know how parents feel about this exactly all the time, but SLPs are very reluctant to have kids spinning. It's not our favorite thing. And so this is a way to get that vestibular input, you know, in a very safe way. Wow. Yep. Okay. So now, um, older individuals, young adults, what we can learn from them, what we can do to help them. Um, so first of all, keep at it. That's the first thing that I've learned as my Benjamin friend gets older. Don't stop. Don't stop. I don't know what it's like when you're 27 years old because Benjamin's not there yet. <laughs> All I know is 26, but he will teach me, I'm sure. So the thing is with, with the language piece itself is individuals may not get a full grammar. I mean, if you start at age eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you may not get a full grammar system, but I hate to say it, but like, who cares? Mm -hmm. Because if you can mitigate well enough to do some mixing and matching, and you're clever, and I know lots of kids who are very clever with their mixing and matching, there are people who will, they'll never know the difference. And if you can get down to the single word, then that means you can do some grammar, and then you can start to self-generate your own, your own utterances. But now, let's just jump down to the last line here. The biggest thing about any of us looking at Gestalt language processing in kids, regardless of how good at it you feel, regardless of how successful you feel, regardless of how far this individual can go, what it says to someone who didn't realize that quote, movie talk was communicative, gets it. And so Benjamin's mother, uh, dear Linda, who's probably listening, said, once I realized he was using his movie talk, to communicate with me, our entire relationship changed. Yeah, profound. Yeah. We might let um, Joe know that we're almost ready for video number one. Okay. All right, so Benjamin, college student, and he calls himself a professional college student, farmer, future farmer, future horticulturist, future zookeeper, constant forever for 16 years, my friend. All right, so now when Benjamin, and we're gonna show right after I quit talking here, Joe. So when, um, when Benjamin was younger, he would say to me, um, he would talk about how he was like, the animal kingdom, various animals in the animal kingdom. The lion has always been his real avatar. Um, dinosaurs take him back to, you know, Mowgli and Land Before Time and all of the things that he wished he had lived through. Mm -hmm. So in his head, while he was doing things that people thought he ought to be doing, he was imagining in his head. He lived in his head. It wasn't that he wanted to be in his head, but we kind of put him there because we didn't really listen to him. Mm. And so to do the things that he really wanted to do, he had to imagine. And he learned at one point that Barney was like the dinosaur that broke free of the stereotypes. And Barney learned how to go to class. Barney learned how to be in school. Barney learned how to have friends. Barney taught other people how to have kindness around them. And so he adopted Barney as his newest avatar. And as he described himself to me, he was a diamond in the rough. And of course he says it, a diamond in the rough. <laughs> of course. And, and without that, really, if, if he had said to me, you know what, 
I'm getting better at stuff and yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have taken him nearly as seriously as when he said, I'm a diamond in the rough. <laughs> now, the third little picture here, and we will have a video of that as well. Um, so we have a video of first the one uh, at the beginning and the one at the end. Um, he said to me, as he was getting to stage three, and he could pare things down to single words, he says to me, and I don't want to spoil it, but I'll give you a little heads up. He says to me, he leans forward into the camera and he says, I just free. So he didn't have to imagine all the time. He is a diamond in the rough. He felt freed from some of the living in his head that he was forced to do. And then the next step in this process, and this happens as individuals free themselves from living in their head. And I point to my right hemisphere as I say this, but free themselves from having to live in their right hemisphere all by themselves, get into their left hemisphere, use language in a way that is analytically put together with grammar. Sometimes the next conundrum is how do you use your whole brain? And I say that because it happens to kids all the time where little kids will be freed of the gestalts. They'll process language with their left hemisphere. They can use grammar. They can say things analytically. And then they're rewarded for it in school because that's what we like. We like kids to do that. And then they forget that they have a whole brain. They forget they have access to a whole brain. So sometimes that's the other parental role, by the way, is, is reminding kids that you do get to imagine. And I will tell you that for Benjamin, he now knows that he gets to do the scholarly, go to college, sit down, look at his computer, listen <laughs> thing, but he also gets to imagine. And for, there were a couple of years when he didn't think that was legitimate. Yeah. All right, so this is the first video. And as you listen to this, sorry, Joe, uh, as you listen to this, listen to how hmm, scary you might think it sounds if you hadn't been prepped that it's not. In other words, this is a pure gestalt delivered in the way that it comes from the video. And in the next slide, you're going to see Benjamin prepping us to not take it seriously. But I want you to just have the visceral experience of taking it literally and then stepping back and not having to take it literally. Okay. Okay. So it's not about dinosaurs, it's about humans. Wow. It's like creatures. Mm-hmm. Creatures were free. That's right. <sighs> uh, 
Okay. So as you could hear, it's a repeated gestalt. Um, and I'll just say this out loud for Jen's sake too. It was a long time ago. <laughs> I was a real terror then. You were? I was a long time ago. You know, you understand? I was a real terror then. You were? Okay. Um, so as you listen to this, and if you didn't know that this gestalt was being said to me on purpose, it might make you worry. Now, Joe, we're going to do the next um, version. And I, I put the words below this um, that tell, that prep us that you're not to take it seriously. So this is the way Benjamin presented this to me. He said, you know, he says it in, in the gestalty voice first. He says, I was a real animal. And then he's one, he doesn't want me to take it seriously. So he says, I'm all right. I'm not dumb. I'm laughing, imagining. I'm all right, dear. A long time ago, I, a long time ago, I was a real terror then. I was imagination. I was imagining all the time. So he's, he's narrated it with, lang with uh, self-generated language. He's mitigated it. And he's playing the original version, which he often does, is play the original version so I can see in his head and I can see how he got there. Ready. I was a wee animal. I'm all right. I'm not young. I'm happy. I'm happy. Nobody else is there. <clears throat> I'm all right, dear. A long time ago, I was a real girl. I was imagination. I was imagining all the time. Yeah. Beep, beep. No, no, sorry. No, I'm starting it off so in my head. This is a long time ago. Alrighty. So if we really had time for a, a big discussion today, I'd love to tap the brains of everyone in this audience today. Let's keep going and just finish this. And then if people can and want to stick around or we can form a little group afterwards, whatever makes sense, but okay. So now here's uh, going to be the third video. Um, and just to give you a little bit of prep for this, um, I didn't write down everything that Benjamin said because there was so much. Um, and these comments are the heart of the message. So the animal he's playing with is Fluffy. Um, and it, his name is Fluffy. He's given him the name Fluffy because of his tail. But his message is interspersed in this. Um, the message is asking me a question. And so he's got this sweet, innocent little character and he's asking me the question, am I gonna be as scared of things when I grow up? And how do I know if I'm gonna be scared? So as you listen to this, First of all, here's here that, that next line, that's where I was little. Now, so that's obviously he's um, not quite mitigated that, um, or he is trying to mitigate that. And he's saying um, the gestalt would be that's when I was little. And so he's saying that's where I was little. So just to not be confused by that, what he means is that's when I was little. And then I comment. So listen to the places where I comment because I was very judicious to not interrupt the story, not interrupt the train of thought, and to comment when it would add a little clarity, but not take away from what Benjamin was doing, from the process he was going through. Because basically he was asking me a question. So then I say something to the effect, and I did have this written down someplace once upon a time, that um, I said, well, it seems scary now, but it won't be so scary when you're grown up. And he says to me with self-generated language, no scary, not anymore. Now you can hear the gestalt part of that. Um, anymore obviously is a phrase that he hasn't broken apart. And I mean, if you were to say it correctly, um, you'd say not then, no scary, it won't be then or not then, but he doesn't have the 
self-generated grammar to say that. So he says, no, scary. Meaning, I don't want to be scary. Mm -hmm. No, don't let me be scary. Uh, not then. And then I, I confirm that when he's grown up, these things won't be so scary. And then he goes into, um, I'm thinking, this is, um, help me with this, Jen. <laughs> I think it's goofy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sorry. I'm See, watching Libby for goofy. just a moment. Sorry. Um, so Goofy is talking about Santa Claus. And he's like, <laughs> you just got to believe. You just got to believe. So that's the line next. And so he's saying, I believe you, Marge. I believe you, Marge. I believe you, Marge. Like, please, please help me with this. Okay. Ready, Joe. Here. Boo, you. Boo, you. Here well, looky here. Fuck yo. Fluffy, fluffy, fluffy like the tails right there. Oh, the ball, the ball. Fluffy, fluffy, it's right there. Bright and cool, snow balloons. Golden, sailing, waves are blowing so down. The ball. Hey, fluffy you tail. <laughs> Yeah, Santa. But that fur is little. Oh. Yeah, I go for how about you? All those giants. Yeah. Well, let's catch them. But that fur is little. Right there. Right. But that fur is little. But that fur was little. Well, catcher was pretty big, gopher. Yeah. Muck. Queen. But that fur was little. That scary when I was little. That's when I was little. It was scary when you were little, but you'll, Zabu. you'll grow up. Zabu. Zabu, you'll grow up. It won't be so scary. Not scary. Yeah. Not anymore. But that's when I was little. I know. Oh, you better watch out. Where to scream. You better tell what a dinner you want. Sandy calls his toes. No, you're not. Possibly like, yeah, just gotta believe. Wow, these guys, guys, he's like dinosaurs. Yes, I'm you. Cobra is big in the hole. <coughs> big is dead. Cobra is in dead. Hmm. <coughs> How's the hole, Gopher? In desert pool. Desert. Run okay. around. Run around. Mud. Ooh, mud on Barney's farm. <coughs> That's running round and running around and running around. Running around, 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 my god, machine right there. <laughs> See that wolf catcher? Those guys will get away from you. <laughs> oh, you're the one who wants to Two. <laughs> Run around. <laughs> the cow's a blue cow. The cow's a giant long tail. Good about skating leaves. Long ago, the world was filled with giants. Scrum! Scrum! And a cow with a giant long tail? Ooh! <clears throat> run! Run, Zabu! Hurry! Yahoo! Barney's farm. <laughs> Back to Barney's farm. That's when you were little, Gopher. Run with Lila. Fills with giants. Scrum! Scrum! Of course, I'm the face. Ah, I mean, uh, I mean, 
But, fellas, my belongs. Take off. Take off with little. Take off. <laughs> See you, giants and littles. Okay. So, um, I would like to ask you remaining people who are watching, participants, how, um, are there any of you who can stay beyond three o'clock or three o'clock Eastern time? And even if you can't, we are recording this so people can come back later, but we're, Marge and I are wondering how much longer we have. So we would love if the people watching would tell us do right, we can finish six minutes or <laughs> we can finish by three o'clock, or we could stop and ask you guys to comment on what you thought as you watched this movie. Okay. Uh, someone says no, but I'll watch recording. Another says yes, we're here. Okay, well, um, does anyone want to comment on what they thought as they were listening to Benjamin? Someone said, more from Marge. Um. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just tell you what I was doing. I mean, obviously- We have the little, we have the little delay, so. Okay. People may um, I mean, I knew Benjamin very well by that time. So I knew when I could comment and not interfere. And I knew him well enough to read between the lines. And I think that if one were to say, what would be uh, kind of a takeaway from this? It would be always read between the lines, always. If it can't be taken literally, then always read between the lines. Partner with families, or if you are a family member, partner with your SLP or whomever is your best contact at school and work together. And yeah, it's invaluable, absolutely invaluable. Um, but you could hear when I commented and, I, and, and what I could tell, going back to the individual who was asking about, you know, the, the person 24 years old vocalizing all the time, you know, I, there are times that Benjamin does vocalize all the time. There are times that he does do that. And if he is, I try still to listen for the threads that might be within that vocalizing. Because sometimes, like Dr. Prasant is saying, he's not regulated. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to get regulated, but he's still communicating. And so if I can hear the, the, the little gem in there that says whatever it might be, then I'll, I'll, that'll catch my ear. I've trained myself to, um, to not tune out the fluff, but to listen for, it's not always the louder parts, it's not always that, but the different parts. Like when you were listening to Benjamin and he was saying, um, you know, I was, I was um, uh, imagining all the time. I was imagining all the time. And you hear the word imagining and you think, oh, there's the mitigation. That's what matters. So you learn the line well enough that when you hear something different, you know it's communicative. Okay. That's part of the lesson there. Wow. Can I ask you, Marge, too, because... Um, being that we do have a lot of people who are interested in non-speakers and AAC users, many of our non-speaking kids use, you know, YouTube clips and things like that. And I just want to briefly from your book, it says, so the next time your child rewinds and replays a short segment of a movie, consider that he's not just stimming, 
or trying to drive you crazy. He's actually trying to work on language development and communicating. He's isolating it from the whole story, isolating it so he can study and use it. it do you have any other tips for those kids who do use those movie scenes? Is there, is there a, a, a way to, to parse out when that is communicative or is that a little more tricky? Well, you know, um, I think about what I used for AAC back in the day, and I would use a really simple uh, kind of um, device where you could record a bazillion things on it and then go back and access. And then you could re-record easily, easily. So it wasn't difficult. And what I did do actually with one individual who would rewind, 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 is I would get the part that he rewound so he'd know that he didn't have to rewind it again in order to have access to it. Right. And like I did say in the book, sometimes it is studying. Sometimes it is really like, how does this timing go? I mean, if you're a non-speaker, you don't have necessarily the ability to give yourself that feedback, you know, whether it's sensory feedback or acoustic feedback, you don't necessarily have that ability, but you can still deal with time. And mm -hmm. so if you know that it takes eight seconds to do that loop and you've got an eight second loop and your head, you know, if you're visualizing it and probably you're visualizing it at the same time, so you've got an eight second loop, you know, and you can catch that eight second loop on your little low tech kind of device, you know, then you've saved it. And yeah. you, you, and obviously you could you can back it up and you can save it someplace else. And if you don't need it anymore, you know, put it in some kind of storage, you know, and don't, and I think the one thing that I've learned too is never get rid of anything mm -hmm. because they always have historic uh, value. <laughs> it's like, it, you know, for Benjamin, I mean, I still have the things that he brought to me when he was young because he knew I wouldn't throw them away. And Linda, if you're listening, you know, moms sometimes decide to clean up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I have a storeroom and I would store these things and you know and so when he first listened to Barney that was under one set of circumstances there were things that he was studying about Barney at mm -hmm. that time when he comes back to Barney later it's for another reason so that didn't exactly answer your question but I would say keep it store it use it don't throw it away okay Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Joe, we are, are we ready for the uh, little video I just freed? Okay. Let's do that. I just free. Next. Okay. Okay, audience reaction, 10 second delay, you can't, I know, but <laughs> it is profound. It is profound. So he was freed up from having to do all of this all alone in his head. And he could do it all. I mean, he can do the gestalts, he can do the mitigations, he can do the songs, he can do the, you know, entertainment. He's a singer, he's a beautiful singer. He can do self-generated language. He can do it all. He's an excellent, you know, typist. He can text, you know, he can do all these things. Um, so that's when I knew we needed to make sure he could still feel legitimate about imagination. So his mom and I have partnered about that. Okay, well, um, moving on to the second individual I want to um, highlight here. This is Derek, whose birthday is Saturday. He'll be 21. And he also is a college student. He's a voice actor. He's an artist. And he's been my friend for the last probably almost four years now. And the creator of Sir Joy's Animals and Dragon. So in these two pictures you see here, um, he's in this same trampoline room that you've gotten to see a few times. And he's with his friend, Connor, who he has cast in different roles in his stories. Um, in one story, Derek was the, um, the brave jack-o'-lantern and Connor was the squash. 
And um, I had told Jen earlier that I loved that story, partly because I was cast in the role of the tree bark, which was a very stationary role. And so what would happen is these vegetables would go out and do good deeds in their neighborhood. And then they would come back at night and check in with the uh, tree bark. And I was honored. So also Derek has taught others of his friends to draw. He's a beautiful artist and that is going on in the other picture. Okay, now we get ready for this um, video. And this one, I want to preface just a little bit um, because Derek had a wonderful SLP who he'd worked with for six years and she had taught him to look at life as a narrative. And it worked perfectly for him because he saw Walt Disney as the epitome of narrative. And for him to look at his own life as a narrative really matched well. So he learned a lot of self-generated grammar and he could do things. He didn't have all of his verb tenses and his pronouns and um, a, a lot of other things grammatically, but he could make himself known. He could tell a story. He could tell what happened over the weekend. But when he came to see me the first time, it was because his father recognized his mother as well, but it was, it was his father who contacted me, um, that there was more to his imagination than he'd been able to uh, tap into. And in a way, what his father said to me at the time was, I don't think we know the real Derek. So you could see Derek is an incredibly like Benjamin, an incredibly kind person who loves all of the, I'm gonna say all of humanity, but he doesn't like villains. Um, he likes heroes. He likes the people who um, have become victimized. He loves all animals. Um, he sees wild animals and, and domestic animals in kind of different ways, but he loves all animals and sees himself as a person who could save a lot of the world. So his first narrative that he wrote for an audience, that was the people in the clinic, uh, Connor and Mitchell and um, all the others was about um, Joey. And we, we soon learned that he was Joey, but Joey was growing up. And so over time, um, as Derek got older, um, Joey morphed into Sir Joey. And you will see a, an illustration of Sir Joey here in just a moment. But this was the day that I started to realize what was happening in Derek's head that he couldn't talk about. He couldn't talk about it because nobody knew that the language of a gestalt movie talk was real. And so he kept it either under wraps or he would say it to himself in his bedroom and drive his brothers crazy. Um, and his brothers learned to completely ignore it, never take it seriously, always assume it was movie talk. And so he never really got to have an audience to these uh, profound feelings that he was having. So this was what he expressed. So I'm gonna read this to you um, just because I, it, it's kind of hard to know exactly what's happening. He's lying on a trampoline with Mitchell and they're throwing this big ball back and forth for regulation and also for turn taking and timing and things like that. Um, and I'm videotaping and of course listening and commenting when it's either appropriate or at times inappropriate. So, <laughs> so he starts to name some um, villains and he names the ghost. Sorcerer and Sorcerer Jafar. They're working those villains together. And that's why he says together. They're working those villains together. So he's asking the question, 
his, his worldview is that you always have a villain. Every one of these movies, there's always a villain. And so his fear is that there's no hope. How can you be a hero? How could you ever come up with a Joey? Because Joey can't do it because these villains all work together. And um, so he's asking the question in the best way he can. And he names some more villains. And he says, and Hunter, and something that some of you who are more um, video literate than me might identify, and Chief. They're all villains working together. Hmm. Hmm. I gather that. Captain Hook, Captain Pete. It is the two of us, Ursula. Now, he's saying these last two comments because I have commented here and I was not to have been part of this conversation. He was talking to Mitchell and I, I wow. became, <laughs> you got it, you got it. <laughs> but so I was Ursula and the thing is, is he could get away with that kind of referencing because nobody took it seriously. And so I'm gonna go on with the story for just a little bit because when I realized that I was Ursula, then I thought, oh boy, you know, that's not a good place to be. But then um, I continued on in my, you know, way, responsible SLP way and um, did things like I had them doing exercises on the trampoline and they were talking about health and nutrition and you know being a really boring person. And um, one day I came in, so he was doing his warm up time. It was always warm up time on the trampoline before we did our quote work, and, which was writing stories. And, um, and I said, um, okay, you guys, have you done your knee drops? And he says, I know Jafar, which was the first time he'd ever taken one of those comments and addressed it in a way that he knew I would understand that I would not be offended, that I would you know, recognize what that meant. And that meant like, back off Marge, we're doing our <laughs> knee drops, we have done to remind us. Okay, ready. The ghost of Saucer and Sa Saucer Jafar. Can they were working those villains together. And Hunter and Tiger and Chief. They're all villains working together. Are there any villains that you're afraid of, Mitchell? It is the two of you. Captain Hook, Captain Pete. Okay. Does anybody want to hear that again? I mean, to me, it is so profound. Let's just go back to those words again. And as his, so this is the way we would talk about it in the clinic, because I had several undergrad students who were working with me at the time, and we would do all this as a team. And so one person, I mean, he was very verbal, as you could hear. Um, and so taking, getting a transcript, we couldn't just tape it and then transcribe it later. It was just too arduous, took too much time. So one of these students was incredibly fast at typing it up really in real time. So she would type, one person was a partner, like Mitchell was in this particular case. One person was kind of the um, arch archivist and keep track of his stories and his characters and, you know, all of that. And then there, um, let's see, then there was one person who was, I, I played the role of the thinker. So kind of the behind the scenes thinker. And sometimes I was the direct interactant, but not, not necessarily. And sometimes, you know, as Jen and I were talking while this movie was going on is it's hard to do when you're the only person. You know, if you're the only, you know, parent at the moment or the only school person at the moment, you know, having, if you could get a, a student to work with you, because it's obviously wonderful, wonderful experience, but just even 
taking notes mm -hmm. is so, what an educational experience it is for students. And now that undergrads don't have a clinical experience in most institutions, you know, there's some real bright young individuals out there who would love it. Oh my goodness, there's so much to do, isn't there? All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so here is Sir Joey. Now, Derek, as you might imagine, had a whole long story. You can see a little bit of it written behind him there. Um, but Sir Joey um, wants to protect the horses, pigs, goats, sheep, turkeys, chickens, geese, rabbits, and all the many animals in farmland and all the people. Now he's joined by lots of other folks. The, um, uh, Sir Duncan, um, sorry, Derek, if you're listening to this. Um, uh, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I think I forgot what, one of the important characters. But you also were with uh, Charlie the dog, your blue and gold macaw named Peppy, doll sheep, and I bet I spelled that wrong, and the Spanish dragon, uh, Tom the turkey, the seal from the Arctic, um, Sir Duncan, who was, yes, indeed, he is the Spanish knight rider, and Sir Jackie, who is the Spanish dragon rider, otherwise known as the captain. And this is all for freedom. So the, the kind of messages that these two individuals have brought to me is so profound that I have absolute ultimate respect for the language, the Gestalt language that has given them this kind of richness. Yeah, it's brilliant. It really is brilliant. And this is, this is Derek's original painting. And it happens to be Benjamin's favorite animal. So I thought that would be a fitting way to close. That's perfect. Um, we, is it okay to ask a few more questions? This mm -hmm. is all, I like this whole time, I just keep thinking, boy, this is, it's such rich communication. It's complex. It's so thoughtful. And, you know, if we view that as a, a, a gift, as a uniquely human way of being, as Barry Prezant would say, you just see it so much differently than, you know, the pathological paradigm that has existed. And, yes, you know, sir. the deep meaning of, this type of communication is so profound. Uh, you know, this, I keep thinking to myself, like, I just, I want to get better at, at being a better communicator. And, you know, hopefully I think that many people here will agree that this has like opened a lot of, you know, it has opened a lot of minds, I would think, um, right. you know, to new ideas that we hadn't really considered before. Well, you know, um, Jen, just to follow up on that, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that part of what, what gave me the confidence to begin with was, and I hate to say it again, but Ann Peters and Barry Present mm -hmm. and Dylan, my buddy Dylan, they gave me the confidence to go into the depths that over time I have. You, it's really hard to do right off the bat yeah unless you can absolutely say to yourself i know this to be true and so i i, I don't think anybody should be too hard on themselves um, in the first stages of trying to think more openly but i think here's here's sorry there's i think that our our clients our kids our students our friends are not expecting great things of us. Yeah. That we are listening matters, period. We could put an exclamation point there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, 
I'll reiterate that just knowing that we're listening, I, I know that I wouldn't want to communicate with someone if I didn't think they were listening to me. And how meaningful is it when you have someone who you know is listening to you? Um, and and I, I'd like to just uh, bring something up that you and I had spoken about before too, is especially parents, you know, we may have had some broad uh, language development, you know, learning at some point, but many of us really don't remember the ins and outs <laughs> of language development. And, you know, if you have a typical child, you know, so long as you're talking to them and, and spending time with them, like it kind of just happens. So when that, it, when that's different and, you know, you're dealing with like a lot of this pathology paradigm, it becomes very scary. And it, it kind of, um, you know, like you've talked about this dichotomy of, of kids being put into like a separate bucket. And, you know, it, the most important point here seems to be believing that your child is communicating, you know, responding to them in the nurturing ways that you typically would be. And just like, you know, understanding that we all communicate, but we may have different ways of doing it. Right. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, okay. So we have a few more questions if that's okay. Sure. Um, so Dr. Prasant had to go, but he had asked before, um, Hey Marge, your experiences and thoughts about the relationship between echolalia and hyperlexia. Ooh, Whoa, <laughs> whoa, and he, and he left, huh? To sort of yeah. answer that one? <laughs> okay, well, I just don't know. I mean, honestly, I would say, I mean, I don't have tremendous expertise in hyperlexia, but what I might say is that if, if in fact, and, and we'll leave this to uh, uh, Dr. Torres to help us figure out, Okay. I can't wait, honestly, for some of her future. But if we could, let's just imagine, let's use Benjamin's terminology. And if we could imagine that individuals who are, uh, let's say on the far ends of the spectrum, so to speak, in terms of gestalt and analytical, mm -hmm. analytic, Let's imagine that those individuals who are the most to that end are visualizing tremendously. And, you know, you think about, and so right brain is going crazy mm -hmm. and it's doing everything visually. And it's got, you know, maybe not a photographic memory in every case, but, you know, and oh, one thing I forgot to say earlier on, and let's, let's allude to that right now, is when, when Dr. Prezant was doing his research, he was finding that individuals who had a gestalt style of thinking were, and he, he's revised this somewhat, you know, over time, you know, in terms of does gestalt thinking equal gestalt language? And he said, it doesn't equal to the degree he thought it once did. Oh. But, um, Nonetheless, what one of his ways of describing how you become a Gestalt language processor is because you have really good episodic memory. You know, as opposed to the referential kind of ball, ball, you know, that you are walking through life literally and the language is part of your experience. And so if indeed those are the individuals who are um, drinking things in at a almost um, uh, you know, at an, well, let's see, at just a super visual level, let's just say, you know, rich, like Benjamin's visual encyclopedia of movies was, I mean, literally hundreds, mm -hmm. hundreds of movies that you could say we're committed to memory, but I think that's the wrong way of looking at it, that it's more that they were just there. They were in his brain and he could access them at any time. Right. And so if you've got visual information, whether it's you know exactly photographic memory or not, 
I don't know where the episodic piece fits into that. It wouldn't have to be, anyway. Um, if that were your uh, cognitive capacity, you can't help yourself but become hyperlexic. You know, you can't help it. Yeah. And you can't help but have all those movies in your head like Benjamin did. You can't help it. Yeah. You can't stop yourself. Wow. Okay. That is um, something to ponder. Um, <laughs> yeah, <at least> ponder. <laughs> right. um, okay. And we'll go on to another one. I'm sure we could continue talking about that for a long time and maybe we'll have to come back and do that at some point. Um, <laughs> okay. So from Portia Gooden, what are your experiences with introducing AAC to students whose spoken output is mostly echolalic? Do certain AAC models help gestalt, gestalt processors? Um, and they have a second part of the question, but maybe I'll let you answer that. Part. Right, well, and you know, and I'm not gonna have a very good answer because I think that what we said already is probably, you know, I hate to say it, but we don't, we don't have a great answer. And I think I would, I would invite that person and anybody else um, to join the, the conversation that we have on the, the NLA uh, study group yeah. um, site, because that is such a conundrum. It is a conundrum. And, you know, one of my colleagues who was an SLP back at our clinic and is now the AAC expert in her school district in California had come up with some nice ideas and there are some ideas being bounced back and forth but yeah it's it's I think it's one of the things that we as a community are going to have to do into the future and we're going to have to design some things that really match what 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 works and and her yeah. name is Jessie Schmidt I'll just say that and she she had some ideas that she even was uh, talking about even as recently as last night where you could have something that would be mitigable and you, you cover up parts and you get to the smaller part and you can uncover parts. So you could kind of go back and forth. Yeah, it's wow. a big, big topic. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. We should take that on. Let's because do that. It really is a barrier to the language development that these non-speakers still have, but there's no easy way for them you know, to express it and to break it down to mitigate, like you said. Right. So, you know, we need like, we need people to come together and, and kind of <laughs> plan out how do we make this easier for people so that they don't, you know, have to, like, we don't want, we don't want it to be so difficult that it's like not worth the trouble. Right. 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 Yeah. Or that yeah. it's, you know, easier for, for people to miss it. Um, so her, the other part of the question was, I'm interested to hear more from you on how you talk with other professionals who want to correct. How do you lead them to honoring incorrect grammar? Ooh, well, let's see. <laughs> I think, I think the answer to that is, um, to just recognize that correct grammar, you know, has a stage. And if a, a child is not using correct grammar yet, it's for a reason. Um, so it's not that we don't wanna to work towards correct grammar, no question, but it's all about um, developmental readiness, honestly. You know, and because this is um, language development, you know, we wouldn't ask a, a little analytic processor who's at the one word stage to say a whole sentence. We just wouldn't do it. And you don't have to, um, argue very far to say he's not ready. And that's really the answer. And so if our Gestalt processors have three stages before they ever get to even putting words together on their own, then grammar is the next stage. Yeah, okay. So basically we're, we shouldn't be forcing things until they're ready. Right, I mean, I think that's the answer to so much is yeah. that I don't know that, that there's so much that we, you know, think is a good idea, and it probably is a good idea if it were developmentally appropriate. Right. Right. You talk about that in your book, actually, and I think you make really great points about that. Um, 
Okay, so now we have another from 111 Tamron. What, uh, what would you advise if a child who is a Gestalt learner is talking a lot at home, but too shy to use their language at school? Oh, well, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, there's a couple of things you could do. You don't want to, first of all, you know, um, scare the child and make the child think like, you know, you're going to expose them as a speaker, you know, until they're ready. But, you know, one, I mean, depending on the school and just depending, depending on the setting and how much freedom you have, and depending on the parents and what the parents think would be, you know, not deceiving the child, you know, a play date is a great idea. Like actually for our intakes um, at our clinic, the very first thing we do is get home videos. And so we see the child, you know, at the child's best. And it's not always best. I mean, obviously, you know, it could be the biggest of, you know, meltdowns or whatever, because the child is, is comfortable and feels free to have a meltdown that they couldn't maybe have with people they don't trust. But um, having um, a series of home videos that aren't planned, nothing, nothing prepared, just natural times of day. So you can hear, you as the SLP can hear vocal access. Mm -hmm. You can hear language under different conditions. You can see um, interests, you can see interactions, you can see um, just what works, what seems to be a good idea. Sometimes, you know, I'll get maybe four videos from home if they're good ones. You know, and I just say, put, put your phone in the, in the corner of your window and just record. And don't worry if, if 30 minutes of recording yields two minutes of something that's useful. You know, you can almost get your assessment done, you know, from that. And so then our second step is to have a home visit where you're not the SLP with a clipboard or anything like that, but I just plan it so that I'm, you know, dear old Aunt Sally, and I came over for a visit, and I kick my shoes off at the door, and the door's unlocked, and I just walk in and, you know, um, hover around whatever um, the parent and the child are doing until the child is convinced I'm, you know, pretty harmless, and I'm not going to ask him or her to do anything, and then my, my goal, and I say it like this, is to become mom, mm -hmm. And so you, you're almost indistinguishable from mom and you don't do anything differently. And if that works, then obviously you can take the next steps and figure out ways to introduce, say, another classmate, you know, into the group and have a play date where, you know, something that's free, like outside. But I have done other things and um, someone who has actually, you know, had a, a label of, um, of uh, selective mutism, in other words, choosing not to, to talk, you know, actually what I've done is I would take a, like a, a recording of that child, you know, whispering and turn up the volume. And it's been wonderful, but, but it depends on the child and it depends on the family and depends on, you know, the classmates. I've had various things where uh, class, uh, an individual would have a couple of friends come over to the clinic and have a birthday party oh. and then have the introduction of the classmates, a couple of classmates, you know, be the introduction that the whole class ended up vicariously having. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, you know, it, so a lot of what you said is trying to build a relationship and feelings of safety between you know the child and the, the caregivers or right. friends right um okay i just want to note that sandy said derek wishes to add marge don't forget spanish night riders <laughs> thank you derek thank you thank you thank you let's go back here oh boy oh boy oh boy yeah i've got some work to do friend sorry about that <laughs> Oh, right. Spanish Night Riders. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> um, oh, okay. by the way, Derek, <clears throat> Jen asked if she could see some more of your drawings. Yes, I would love to. <laughs> um, 
Okay, we have another question from Stephanie P. And she says, is it typical for analytical language learners to use gestalts? My toddler appears to learn language analytically, but she echoes phrases too often, but not always in appropriate context. Oh my, just very smart person. So I said to Jen the other day, I said, we're not gonna talk about that because it's confusing. <laughs> But here we are talking about it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, we all use both systems. Yeah. We all do. And it goes back to, you know, Ann Peters, you know, she would talk about the percentage of a particular child's gestalt language versus the percentage of a child's analytic language. And, you know, different language approaches for different purposes. You know, if it's like to figure out the social protocol of, hi, how are you, you know, or bye, see you later, you know, of course, you're going to do it gestalt. Mm -hmm. If it's about, you know, telling all the things that you don't want to eat for dinner, you know, you're going to do it analytically. And so yes, we all do that. And of course, the part that is confusing is this, as long as we've broached the subject, um, is that a single word can be one or the other. Mm. that's what gets tricky and it sounds like tell me again Jen the person who asked that question um, is it a, a mom uh yep it's her toddler yay for you okay well then you can present part of our next webinar mom. <laughs> and we should talk about that we should talk about how it is when everything is going right we should talk about that yeah. No, that's, that's beautiful and perfect. And that's how it was in the olden pre, you know, media days. That's how it was. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess I have like one last, I mean, I could continue asking you questions for the rest of the night, really. But um, <laughs> if like, what are your tips for clinicians who are trying to help people think more broadly about development in general, including language development, you know, like this perspective that you have, um, it's based on research, it's based on child development, best practices in child development, you know, all kids are children and all <laughs> kids are human. And, you know, there's no, like we, we have, we have separate, separated people in a way that's really not helpful for their development. So what's your advice on how to kind of bring more people into back to where uh, we all need to be? You're all, you are right. And, and it's all, I think I, I hate to put too much pressure on Dr. Torres, but I think <laughs> she's going to help us a lot. I seriously think she's going to help us a lot because I think her research is bringing us back to individuals. Yeah. And I think where we went wrong as a group of adults is we tried to get very fancy, smart. Um, you know, in speech language pathology, we've always talked about differential diagnoses as if it's either this or it's this. Right. And obviously we know it's not. We know that there are plenty of things that are all combined. But on the other hand, I think what's happened is now a days we give individuals a label, a name, a diagnosis, a number, a list, you know, of diagnoses, <laughs> but we forget to look at the person. Yeah. Because we think we already know. And so um, as someone asked me the other day, you know, do you always want to use a visual schedule if a kid is autistic? Do you always want to, you know, have visual um, uh, uh, prompts or use visual, visual stuff that way? And, you know, you hate to give the answer like it all depends, mm -hmm. but the, the fact of the matter is it feels to me is that once we give a label, we, we stop looking. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's we, we we're th we're looking at the labels as an answer rather than 
like a map of, you know, where do we explore more? Right. Where do we explore more? And you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, you, you take somebody who has a, a label of autism, you know, and as we've gotten everything so clumped, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's, it's probably really good for central tendency research because mm -hmm. then we can find, you know, that it's not, <laughs> you know, that there's yeah. actually quite a lot of diversity. Yeah. Huh. But Dr. Torres's research is going to be exactly what we need. Ha ha. And uh, just to plug that in yet again. But um, seriously, I think we have done that is we've done so much clumping that we think we know what we're saying when we say autism and we just don't. Yeah, we just don't. So this person was asking me, well, what about all the visual stuff? And I said, well, you know, as just like you said, Jen, it ought to be the beginning of how we assess. It's not the end of an assessment. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think that's a great way to leave things off. Um, we, uh, uh, Christine Jenkins said, presume, presume competence always labels are just a signpost. Um, this has been so valuable and helpful to really rethink uh, how we view language, how we yeah. view communication, how our, uh, behavior, our own behavior impacts the, you know, responsiveness and, and development of others. And, you know, this is not, um, none of this happens in a vacuum, which you've said, you know, this is all it, it, we make or break whether um, our kids, you right. know, can commute, can develop to their best potential based on yeah. And just like, I mean, I hate to now be quoting Dr. Torres all the time, but it goes back to the observer effect and the ADOS, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Yeah. So I appreciate you so much. Um, thank you for spending so much time with us. Thank you so much to everyone who watched. Um, like I said, this will be available. Uh, you know, it'll stay on our website. We will have all of Marge's um links posted so that people can access those. Her website is also amazing. If you don't get the book, which I still highly recommend because it's so thorough, um, but her website also has these wonderful articles that you can read. Um, the let's Natural Language Acquisition Facebook group, go ahead. Say the, let's say the name of that one article. So the one article um, that you can search for right away is um, it, was a, it was a column series. So it's so the, it, it's a kind of a strange name. It's called Finding the Words was the column. And then there's a colon and it says to tell the whole story. And so it really does cover this in a bit truncated form. Yeah, it's really, um, we're gonna, I'll make sure that we post that in the chat now before we go, but we'll also put it in the video description. Um, and I would also like to add that Next week, we're actually airing a three-part AAC series that we have um, with Amanda Merlin. Um, I hope people will tune in for that. We did record it a while ago, but you know it'll be there and it's really, really uh, wonderful you know, to introduce people to AAC. And, and hopefully, hopefully this is another one of the areas that we will continue to grow and realize that everyone has the right to communicate and everyone does communicate. And we just have to make sure that we aren't stifling that communication with our own bias. <laughs> we have to make sure that we are, you know, championing everyone so that people can, can communicate the, the best way for them. Um, so once again, Marge, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. That was just great. Thank you so much. Um, can I end with one quote um, that someone wrote? Um, uh, I'll leave, we'll leave it off with that for this for good. 111 Tamron says, thank you so much. As a parent of a child who uses echolalia a lot, this has been the most insightful discussion I've been part of on the subject. So. Well, thank you thank all. You so I'm much. glad there were so many parents here. That was wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks again.